Okay, ladies, we're going to go ahead and get started this morning. And I'm going to give y'all a little plug this morning. Um, I can't do it as fun as Ashley and Jackie wanted me to because they're no fun. But I was going to give you a better visual of the bra thing, but I didn't do it today. But just a reminder that we're collecting bras and underwear for... um, BFT, why can't I get it out? Blah, blah, blah. Bridging for tomorrow, that's what I was trying to say. So just a reminder, and you know, I got these for under $20 at Costco and two bras come in the package. And they come in different sizes um, from small all the way to extra large, so that's kind of cool. Anyway, okay, let me get uh, started by praying for us first. Father, we come before you this morning, Lord, and as we look into these two chapters, Father, first I just pray a blessing over these women for just getting out, um, braving the rain, doing two lessons this week. So Lord, I just ask that this word that you've given us would fall fresh on us, that we wouldn't look at these chapters as just more opposition that Nehemiah is facing, but instead, Lord, we would look at the specific opposition because you give it to us in our word, in your word, so that we can understand, Lord, how we're to respond to that opposition. And thank you for the wonderful leadership skills he has and the wonderful example uh, that he has for us to follow. I love, Lord, hearing all the things these ladies are learning, but I ask, Father, that you would go before us and you would teach us even more this morning. So, Lord, I empty myself this morning and ask that you would squeeze all of me out and that you would fill me in, Lord. Thank you for your Holy Spirit that leads and guides as we've studied this week, who counsels our hearts, Lord, and shows us the deep and hidden things in your word. I lift this all up to you in your precious name. Amen. Okay, so ladies, after working on two lessons this week and then hearing Dan's sermon on Sunday, did you feel like you were surrounded by Nehemiah? (laughs) I did, but I was really excited about it too. And Dan gave us a completely different look at what a sloth is because it is certainly not like the cartoon characters that we're seeing everywhere lately. See, they're just so cute but that's not what God's calling us to be as a sloth. So last week when we looked in chapters four and chapter uh, five, we saw how Nehemiah motivated a very diverse group of people to basically do an impossible job. We looked at his leadership skills and the various strategies, but you know, his greatest resource was his faith in God. So I have my faith necklace on this morning. God called Nehemiah to rebuild these walls. He gave him all the resources he needed, and he even gave him King Artaxerxes to come alongside him as well. So he encountered opposition from those bullies, Sanballat and Tobiah, um, in our last lesson, and then also some from within the ranks, from the people, as a result of these guys, uh, their threats that caused fear in the people. But he did what any great leader does. He listened to the people. He devised a plan in case that attack came to fruition. And most important, he prayed and he pointed these people back to God. He reminded them not to fear man, but to trust in their great and awesome God. And remember, he reminded them to fight for your families, your wives, your husbands, your children to fight. And when we left off last week, the people were working diligently. Remember, they had a tool in one hand and they had a weapon in the other. And I kept thinking about a mother with a baby on her hip and a vacuum cleaner. That's kind of our weapons. Anyway, it states too that they didn't even take their clothes off. They stayed inside the walls at night and they posted guards. So go ahead and open up your Bibles with me to chapter five. This week, we're gonna look at the outcry of the people against their fellow Jews. And then we're gonna see how Nehemiah addresses this situation and how he brings not only restoration, but he also brings restitution. And then in chapter six, he faces another type of opposition. But this time, the opposition is is a personal attack on Nehemiah's character. So chapter six or chapter five begins with the word now. And how many of you in frustrated moments have said, well, what now? <laughs> what could possibly go wrong now? 
Well, one thing that we have to remember is that our enemy never takes a break. We can't let our guard down because he is relentless. Nehemiah's now is that there's an, a great outcry from the people and it's against their fellow Jews. This is more opposition from within the ranks, but as we look at it, we're gonna see how it's different. Look at verse one. Notice that it says, not only the men, but their wives too were raising a great outcry. And the reason that the wives are mentioned is because they don't normally get involved in the public affairs, but it's so bad that they begin to protest as well. So this, ladies, as we look into it, this is a story story of the haves and the have-nots. So we're going to look at four different complaints from the have-nots, and it's, ex it's a classic example for us of how the rich take advantage of the poor, and sometimes they continue to take advantage of it, even though they know what they're doing is wrong. They're just getting richer. It, it it's what really makes it sad, though, is they're doing it to their fellow Jews. It would be like if you were taking advantage of a family member that you knew was going through hard times and struggling, and you just continued to take advantage of them. So look at verse 2. It says, some, now this is where I've got to remember what I'm doing. Okay, it says some were saying, we and our sons and our daughters are numerous. In order for us to eat and stay alive, we must get grain. Others were saying, we're mortgaging our fields, our vineyards, our homes to get grain during the famine. Still others were saying, we have had to borrow money to pay the king's tax on our fields and vineyards. Although we are of the same flesh and blood as our fellow Jews, and though our children are as good as theirs, yet we have to subject our sons and daughters to slavery. Some of our daughters have already been enslaved, but were powerless because our fields and our vineyard, vineyards belong to others. So again, this is a different kind of opposition. And I don't know about you, um, but I can more readily handle opposition from the outside more so than I can from within my family because then it becomes personal. And we talked about that external opposition like during 9-11 and that kind of opposition can cause people to band together and to come together. But when it's internal, things can begin to kind of unravel. And have you ever experienced or maybe even seen in a family what happens maybe when a marriage is falling apart or there's a teenager that's completely out of control. Everything in their home just kind of ceases. The work can kind of stops. They're no longer working together as a team. And Jesus tells us in Luke 11 that a house divided against itself cannot stand. So let's get a little bit of history here as we look at the outcry of these people. We, if you read Ezra, you would remember that in chapter one, when the exiles originally returned, they were very well off. They had lots of worldly goods. It said that they, list, they even listed all, the summary of all the gold and the silver and things that they brought. And then when we look at Nehemiah chapter seven next week, we're, we're also gonna see how the people gave generously to the temple. So what happened? Why the outcry? There can be a number of reasons. Their first outcry is we don't have enough food to eat. There was a food shortage. So it could be a result of several things. Maybe they were so busy working on the wall that they didn't have time to plant crops. We know that there's a famine in the land because it tells us that right there in verse three. And it also says in verse two that it seems as though their population is growing because it said that they're very numerous. And then others had to, and then others had grain, but to get it, what did they have to do? They had to mortgage their fields and vineyards and homes. So they were basically mortgaging their assets to pay their bills and to feed their families. And then others who didn't want to mortgage their assets, basically, they had to borrow money just to pay for the king's taxes. Now, you know you have a problem if you have to borrow money just to pay your taxes, okay? And the king's taxes, it tells us, were exorbitant. They were high. And who's taking advantage of it? their fellow Jews. They were charging them exorbitant interest rates to loan them money. Their final outcry was that they had to subject their, subject their sons and their daughters to slavery. In other words, they were selling them to somebody else to pay their bills. 
Now, how would that make you feel if you had to sell your children into slavery to pay your bills? Guess what? That still happens, ladies. That happens in other countries. Just to feed their families, they're selling their children to have money come in. So what's Nehemiah's response? Look at verse six. It says, when I heard their outcry and these charges, I was very angry. So next, he blows his top and he lets those greedy Jews have it, right? Well, yes and no, because he pondered first, then he let them have it. But he did. He pondered that this in his mind, it tells us in chapter, or verse 7. I pondered them in my mind and then I accused the nobles and the officials. I told them, you're charging your people interest. So I called, am I on the right slide? No? Okay, let me go back. Um, I think I jumped ahead. No, I am. Sorry. This is where I need my glasses. So I told them, you're charging your own people interest. So I called them together in a large meeting and I said, as far as possible, we have brought back our fellow Jews who were sold to the Gentiles, but now you're selling your own people only for them to be sold back. They kept quiet because they could say nothing. So what Nehemiah does is he gets right to the heart of the issue. I love that about him. He's not beating around the bush. The wealthier Jews were exploiting the um, poor Jews and he's calling them out. And it says that he pondered. So what that means is he is consulting his heart. He got a hold of himself before he got a hold of them. And moms and grandmas, that's a good word to us. In his mind, he pondered the situation before he responded. Now, how many of you wish that you were better at pondering before reacting um, and allowing, as I always say, your brain, uh, allowing your brain to engage before your mouth does? So I'm still working on that at 57 years. But anyway, Warren Wearsby points out that one thing for, it was one thing for Nehemiah to confront the enemies, but something else to deal with your own people when they fight with one another. If you've ever had to confront selfishness or greed in your family, I'm sure you probably understand what that's like. Have you ever had to probate a will in your family? I have recently. It's not fun. So this is what ne made Nehemiah such an extraordinary leader, though. He thought before he reacted. He could have said, hey, guys, I came here to build a wall. I didn't come here to negotiate your fights or reform this city. But he didn't do that. Instead, he had righteous anger over what was wrong, and he was calling them out. But first, he took counsel with himself, and he considered what God's standard was instead. In other words, he wasn't thinking about what he thought was right. He was going back to what God's word says was right. James Boyce said, real anger should be felt for those who profess to walk by God's standards, and yet they compromise those high standards by their actions. So isn't it interesting on Sunday that Pastor Dan talked about what it looks like to be a sloth, he said that it is somebody who steps away from God. They stop spending time with God, being in God's word and praying. They turn inward and they're all about themselves. It's the polar opposite of love. And a sloth doesn't care about others. They're apathetic and they have no compassion. And this is certainly a picture of what we're seeing happening here. Like, again, how could you watch your brothers and sisters sell their children and take advantage of them. Notice that he confronted the nobles and the officials first, because as we've talked about before, as the leader goes, so goes the group. Then he calls them together for a meeting, because after all, what good is it doing for them to build these walls and yet live in these walls and exploit one another? And what that says to us as Christians, we should look different from the world around us. And Nehemiah was wise, and he called them to account, like I said, based on God's word. And in Deuteronomy 23, it says, do not charge a fellow Israelite interest, whether on money or food or anything else. And it also says in Exodus, if you lend money to one of my people among you who is needy, do not treat it as a business deal. Charge no interest. 
So Nehemiah goes on to ch- continue to chasten the people. They bought their brother. They brought bought back their brothers, only for them to be sold. And if you remember, they were had before the exile. They were in Egypt, and what happened is, is they became um, engulfed or indoctrinated, whatever, into the Egyptian culture. They came in as agricult- agricultural people but then they learn to be merchants, okay? And I don't know if you know this, but many of our department stores like Macy's and Neiman Marcus and Sackowitz, did you know that they were started by Jewish families? And what happened is with these people, the love of money superseded what they knew was right in God's eyes. So they were willing to um, take advantage of the others. And what did they say? Well, they said nothing. They knew God's word and who can argue with that? And there's nothing wrong with lending money. He says that's okay in Exodus, but they could only do it as long as they were not taking advantage. And what is our response? What is God's word or is God's word the final word in your life? And I ask you this last week too, how are you being sucked into the culture to tweak God's word or to bend God's word to make it more culturally relevant, even though God's word is clear that we're not to do that? And how are you treating those people that you might employ? Now, maybe you don't employ anybody, but maybe you have somebody that cleans your house, or maybe you go get a manicure or a pedicure. And when you go to a restaurant, are you a cheap tipper? Are you paying the least amount you possibly can to those who do a service for you? And when was the last time you gave or did something a little extra for someone? And then take it a step further. How are you training your children? How are you showing your children how to serve somebody? Like maybe can they take a cold glass of water um, to your garbage man? or leave a little something in your mailbox, you're teaching your children how to serve those around you. Now, we have a number of things going on at my house right now. It always happens on Thursday morning. Um, We're doing some remodeling, so to speak. Anyway, when I buy these guys lunch, it's almost like their mouths drop. They're so surprised. But as Christians, we should always be going the extra mile when we have the means to do so. So God holds us accountable for what he blesses us with and he expects us to bless others. Where much is given, much is expected. So then let's look with me at verses nine and 11. So Nehemiah is on a roll here. It's kind of like he's saying, and another thing. So he says, so I continued. What you are doing is not right. Shouldn't you walk in the fear of our God to avoid the reproach of our Gentile enemies? I and my brothers and men are also lending the money and grain, but let us stop charging interest. Give back to them immediately their fields and their vineyards and their groves and their houses, and also give back the interest, 1% of the money, grain, new wine, and oil." These people were supposed to be a light to the Gentiles and the pagans around them, but they were showing them the wrong way to go. They were anything but a witness. Now, when Nehemiah says that he and his men are also lending money and grain, he doesn't mean that he's doing it with interest. It wasn't the lending, like I said, that was a problem. It was that they were so tight-fisted with their money. In Deuteronomy 15, it says, God tells us not to be tight-fisted, to be open-handed and to freely lend to those in need. It was all about the interest. Not only, I have to keep remembering to do this, not only did he tell them to stop, but what else did he tell them to do? Make restitution, to give it back immediately, their fields and vineyards and homes, and all the interest. And if you, um, I think one of the questions asked, did you realize that it wasn't just a little bit of interest? He's charging 12% interest to the people. And then in verse 12, they agree. And they say, great, well, I'll give it back and we won't do anything else. Now that seemed pretty easy, didn't it? And don't we wish that everybody we confronted just said, great, oh, 
I'm, I'm gonna do exactly what you said. So it almost seems to be too good to uh, be true, as the saying goes, which is probably why Nehemiah took it one step further and he called them to take an oath to keep their promise and he did it in front of the priests. Um, so basically a little more collateral there. And we need to remember too that our words can be cheap and we can say a quick yes just to kind of move things along. But the oath that they were taking was between them and the Lord. And taking an oath with the Lord is a very serious thing. Then, if you remember, he shakes out the folds of his robe. So what is this about? He's giving them another visual of what God would do to them if they didn't keep their promise. He's saying, may you be shaken out and may you be emptied. I thought about parents, you know, with their pockets out and they tell their kids, do you think money grows on trees? He's pulling out his pockets. This is what God is gonna do to you if you go back on your promise. And something similar happened to Paul in Acts chapter 18 when the, they were opposed to his teaching. And he basically said, your blood be on your own heads. I'm innocent of it. And everybody says, amen, which means so be it. So why do you think the next thing they did was praise the Lord? Last week, we talked about cleansing that comes from our confession it brings us freedom from guilt and it restores our relationship with God. They knew God's word and they knew what God expected of them. One teaching I heard says that when we deal with our problems in the light of the will of God and as declared in the word of God, we walk in the freedom of God. And that makes our hearts unburdened and our step a little bit lighter. Look with me at verses 14 through 19. Here we're gonna see that Nehemiah is leading the people by example. He says that when he was appointed as the governor of Judah, neither he nor his brothers ate the food allotted to the governor. He wasn't asking again the other leaders to do more than he was willing to do himself. And as we'll see, he did a whole lot more. In verses 15 and 16, he says, but the earlier governors, those preceding me, placed a heavy burden on the people and took 40 shekels of silver from them in addition to food and wine. Their assistants also lorded it over the people, but out of reverence for God, I did not act like that. Instead, I devoted myself to the work on the wall. All my men were assembled there for the work. We did not acquire any land." Now, just because Nehemiah held the officer of governor, some specific rights and privileges were given to him. But even though he was governor for 12 years, he said he did not take advantage of that. And you remember that Nehemiah was promoted from the cupbearer to the governor. That's quite a leap. So he was large and in charge, wasn't he? But he never saw it that way. He was the exact opposite of his predecessors. And he says, I wasn't like the previous governors. I and my men devoted ourselves to the work on the wall and I didn't acquire any land, which seems kind of random. But what does that mean when he says, I didn't acquire any land? So remember, the wealthy Jews were taking advantage of the poor. And Nehemiah also had a perfect opportunity here to capitalize on this city that was in ruin. He and his men, because things were so bad, he could have bought the land cheap and he could have sold it high at quite a nice profit. Just like it was his right to the allotted food, he also had the right to buy up that land, but he didn't do it. In verses 17 and 18, it says that twice... It says twice that the food allotted to the governor, it says twice that there was food allotted to the governor, but he never took advantage of it. What did he do instead? He fed 150 people from his own table and then some out of his own pocket. Um, Nehemiah was a giver, not a taker. He wasn't the type of man who lorded his position over others. And remember, we talked about how the previous governors couldn't get the wall built. It's been in a heap of rubble for almost 100 years. They had the authority, they had the leadership, but they couldn't motivate the people. Nehemiah got it done because he was a man of integrity, a man of influence, and the people respected him. And they were willing to follow. 
D.L. Moody says, a holy life will produce the deepest impression. Lighthouses blow no horns. They only shine. And Nehemiah was a shining example. And he wasn't blowing his horn here when we record this. He's just journaling in his memoir what he did and what he didn't do. And how about you? Have you ever worked for a boss that you didn't respect? You did what you were told, but your heart attitude wasn't right? And as one of the tables, it was interesting, they mentioned this morning that we live in a world where we think we have all these rights and privileges coming to us. I have a right to do this and I have a right to do that. We think that it's owed to us. But Nehemiah recognized that leader, with leadership comes responsibility. If a leader cares only, or a mom, or whatever, if you care only about your rights and your privileges, then you will never become a person of influence. We don't, when we don't stand up for what we know is right and train those around us to do the same, we don't have much of a Christian witness, and who cares what name is behind, or what title is behind our name? Maybe you're thinking, well, I'm not really in a leadership position. Think about your marriages. Think about your parenting. Think about when you wake up in the middle of the night to a child that's crying or sick. And guess what? Your rights and privileges just went out the window. And your me time is over if you're sleeping. But we have a responsibility to those in our families as well. And my favorite thing about this chapter is what motivated Nehemiah. Let it be the motivation of our lives too. What were three things that Nehemiah did that set him apart? Look with me at verse nine. You have to look back a little bit. It's obvious because it talks about the fact that Nehemiah walked in the fear of the Lord and he was motivated not only to honor God, but also to avoid the reproach of others. He was not only concerned with the glory of God, but his Christian witness. In other words, he walked what he talked. Look at verse 15. It says that Nehemiah had reverence for the Lord and he was not willing to act like the people around him. He knew that God had set him apart for a specific work and out of reverence for God, he kept himself focused and dedicated. He didn't cave to the culture that says, it's okay, Nehemiah. Everybody else is doing it. All the other governors did it. It's okay for you to do it too. So what do you think the difference is between fear and reverence? They're both a deep sense of awe and respect, but reverence can also describe how you treat someone. And Nehemiah feared God, but his reverence was a response to that fear that overflowed in how he treated others. And that brings me to my third point. Look at verse 18. He never demanded, even though he was entitled to the food allotted to him as governor. Why? Because he not only had reverence for the Lord, but he cared about those that he was leading. He didn't have the heart to demand and put that additional burden on the people. And isn't that a great example for us to follow? And shouldn't that be our example? I mean, shouldn't that be the motivation that we have for our lives? Because it's certainly the pattern that our Lord and Savior set for us to follow. And it tells us in Matthew um, 2028, Jesus said, just as the son of man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. If we live our lives this way, we can also say the same thing that Nehemiah said in verse 19. Remember me with favor, O God, for I have for all I have done for these people. If Nehemiah was after the applause of man, he would not have led like he did. He was after the applause of God, his audience of one. Hebrews 6, oh, and see, I didn't go fast enough. Hebrews 6.10 says, God is not unjust. He will not forget your work and the love you have shown him as you have helped his people and continue to help them. When we help others, we're serving God. So I wanna ask you, how do you wanna be remembered? Okay, let's go ahead and look at chapter six. 
And so far, we've seen Nehemiah face three kinds of opposition in the last two chapters that came through um, chapters that threatened to stop the rebuilding of the wall. The first two came from pagan enemies. Remember, they were ridiculing him and they were mocking him. The second was from a threat of violence. The third opposition was due to the, uh, to the greed of the wealthy Jews. But now they're back to work. And I don't know about you, but if I were Nehemiah, honestly, I think I would start to wonder, did I hear God correctly? Because here comes more opposition. And this time, they're attacking him and his character. So ladies, the Bible describes Satan as a roaring what? Lion. And he also describes him as an angel of what? Light. Yes, an angel of light. And that's what we're gonna see as we look into this opposition here. So word got back to Sanballat and Tobiah and Jeshem that the wall was complete and there were no gaps. All that was left was putting the gates in place. So it says in, nope, I'm jumping ahead again. Verse two, Sanballat came to me with this message. Come, let us meet together in one of the villages on the plain of Ono. So like the enemy, these guys are deceivers and they're sneaky. And Nehemiah, he knew better than to go. He knew better than to go because walls without gates are like no walls at all. He knew that they were conspiring to harm him by luring them away from the work that um, he was doing. And he told them straight up in verse three, he's busy, I'm on an important project. Why would I leave and go down to you? He said it nicely, but he said, and you gotta see this coming, oh no to oh no. <laughs> so where did Nehemiah get all of this wisdom? Y'all had wonderful verses to look up this week. It comes from God, and it tells us in Daniel 2.22, he reveals what is uh, lies in darkness, and I loved that. So how many times did they persist and get the same answer from Nehemiah? Four. Now, we can't think that just because we resist the enemy once that he's not going to come back. He's crafty, and he's trying to appear like these three enemies as that angel of light that I talk about, they want him to, you know, come to this meeting. Uh, let's have a meeting of the minds. Here, let's kind of work out a treaty or something. But Nehemiah doesn't fall for it. Wearsby points out that a happy compromise can invigorate marriage or strengthen a community, but this kind of compromise among people who don't have the same agenda or purposes in mind is harmful. When you invite the devil into your team, you can expect him to change the rules, the goals, and expect to be defeated. So how did he know they were lying? Well, he looked at their past performance. He knew where God was calling him. He knew he had nothing in common with these guys because he told us that in chapter two when he said, but as for you, you have no share in Jerusalem or claim or historic right. He knew they would only be a snare. And the next move was to attack his character with rumors. So how about that letter? You know, the one in verses five through seven that's described as an unsealed letter that's being written or being read by every single person whose hands it traveled through. That would be like sending this out and they're like, well, wow. So Nehemiah isn't the person everybody thought he was. He, oh, he and those Jews, they're planning a revolt. And Jeshem, even though that's his enemy, he says it's true, so it must be. So that's why he's rebuilding that wall. They want protection, somewhere to hide when the revolt starts. And that Nehemiah, I knew he couldn't be trusted. He's planning to become their king. Well, no wonder he's building that wall and trying to win over their favor. The king will stop at nothing to take him down if he hears about this. I better get this passed off so the next person can hear about it. Ladies, that's what gossip does. I hope that's not me. That's okay. So why was this letter unsealed? Because he wanted everybody to read it. So this is the ancient equivalent of posting it on the internet or telling your Aunt Alice 
or as we're calling it lately, fake news. Letters to the officials, though, they were supposed to be rolled up. They had an official seal on them so that the only person that could read them was the person it was intended for. So Sanballat, he wanted that slander and that gossip to spread. He knew that if a report got back to the king, the potential for shutting down uh, the rebuilding of the wall was possible. And I'll tell y'all, I'll never forget being on Facebook and something pops up that says, Chip and Joanna Gaines have filed for divorce. And I thought, oh no, not them. I know better. I clicked on it. And I will tell you the most awful pornographic picture popped up. That was a lesson. Kirsten, don't have itching ears for gossip and slander. So that was a really good, whew. anyway. But you know what makes this so painful for Nehemiah? It's because it was all untrue. They were attacking him personally and his character and not a shred of it had truth in it. He was being attacked for the exact opposite of what he was trying to do. And have you ever found that with critics, they'll often accuse you of the things that they're the ones that are guilty of doing? Now, Nehemiah, authorized, or Nehemiah was authorized by the king to be, rebuild that wall, and the king was funding the whole thing. So who's really opposing it? These guys were. Psychologists call this projection, and it's when people accuse you of the very things that they're doing. They're projecting their sins on you. So the Greek word in the Bible for devil is diablos. Do you know what it means? It means slanderer. So when you slander someone, you are doing the work of the devil. So how did Nehemiah respond to this unsealed letter? He sends a reply and he basically says, that's all just a bunch of baloney. None of it's true. He writes in his journal, they're just trying to scare us. He didn't play into their hands. But what often happens to us when our character is slandered? What do we wanna do? We want to defend ourselves. And what happens is we lose our focus on what we should be doing because we're spending so much time trying to come up with a rebuttal, um, maybe to have revenge or just being so upset about it or coming up with that, you know, wonderful counterattack. And we know as women, we may not say it, but we're working it out in our minds, aren't we? We were talking about that at that table back there. But he simply states that it's not true and he recognized it for what it was. And then what does he do? He prays and he asks God to strengthen his hands. Although he denied it was a rumor, he didn't know though if it would get so far as to get to the king and word get back, he could possibly be beheaded for it. But he turned to the sovereignty of God and he prayed. So then Nehemiah faces another form of opposition in the form of intimidation or fear. And it's kind of weird because it doesn't really tell us here why he was willing to go, and I'll probably slaughter his name, to the house of Shemaiah. But for some reason, he trusted this guy and he went. Maybe he thought that he would give him a word of encouragement as a prophet. So he's being summoned by him in verse 10. Am I in the right place? Yes, okay. So he's saying, come on, come. Let's meet in the house of God. Let's go inside the temple and let's close the doors, you know. Let's be safe because men are coming to kill you. They're coming by night to kill you. Another fear tactic. And what does fear do? It causes us to act irrationally. Do y'all know the acronym for fear? False expectations appearing real. He's saying, come in here, come in here where you'll be safe. But what we can't tell from our English translation is that this is being dressed up as an oracle presented to Nehemiah as though it was a revelation from God. And fear says, and look at verses uh, 11, you know, Nehemiah, fear says, well, should I run? Should I run into the temple? And then it's like, he's like, whoa, wait, wait. I'm not gonna do this. He realizes that God had not sent him. Your study guide says, ask what, your study guide asks, what guide has God given us in understanding and in practicing truth? 
Well, he's given us the Holy Spirit that gives us wisdom and counsel and insight. Nehemiah recognized it for the scam that it was. And the saddest part is that this prophet was willing to be hired to do the dirty work of these guys. Shemaiah was hired to intimidate and to commit a sin and give Nehemiah a bad name. But whose name is recorded as the bad guy? So look with me in verse 14. Remember Tobiah and Sanballat, my God, because of what they have done. Remember also the prophet Noadiah and how she and the rest of the prophets have been trying to intimidate me. So what that tells us, you might have skipped over. There were others, not just this guy, that were trying to intimidate him. He asked God to remember the sinful and deceptive ways of these guys and this prophetess. He doesn't tell God how to deal with them just to remember their evil deeds and left it in God's hands. Hebrews 10, 31 says, it is a dreadful thing to fall into the hands of a living God because God says he will avenge and he will repay. So Nehemiah knew God's word. He knew it was forbidden for him to go into that temple. He knew he could go to the temple, but he wasn't allowed to go into that sacred part of the temple, the Holy of Holies. And this is where the high priest would go once a year to offer sacrifices on the Day of Atonement. In fact, Jewish culture teaches us that the high priest would literally have a rope tied around his ankle in case he didn't do his duties in the Holy of Holies precisely as God commanded so that if he dropped dead or God struck him dead, they could just pull him out with the rope because they weren't gonna go in there. So that points us to the seriousness of sin. And then what does verse 15 say? And just like that, the wall was completed in 52 days. Not halfway up, no gaps were left in it. Mission accomplished. It's almost like there's just no fanfare. Of course, it's a guy. He just meant, okay, it's done. The wall's completed. We women, we would add all kinds of details. And then in verses 16 through 19, it's almost like a footnote here. What did verse 16 say their response was to the completion of the wall? It says that their enemies, yes, that their enemies lost their self-confidence and they realized the work had been done with the help of God. Notice that credit was not given to the hard work. It was given to God. And, and that was by their enemies. In verses 17 through 19, it talks about all these letters that are going back and forth um, because it also notes that Tobiah, and it does, it's not real clear in here, but it talks about how these people are under oath to him. Basically, if you were to research the commentaries, you would recognize he's related and he's very well connected. So these people had a loyalty to him because of an oath. So in other words, um, those letters that were going back and forth, they were sent to intimidate Nehemiah and then they were sending reports back about what he did. So intimidation and sidetracking, and slander, and scare tactics. These are all very real things that we face in our lives too. And those are the things that can keep us from moving forward and working on the restoration in our lives that we need to. But we need to stay on the wall, ladies. And as we close, I have three lessons for us. And the first one is, until Jesus returns, there is no happily ever after. And that's because the enemy is our adversary and he wants us to keep, he wants to keep us from the work that God's calling us to. Be alert, ladies, and be of sober mind because your enemy really is prowling around like a lion or an angel of light for someone to devour. So stay on that wall and keep your focus on God. And number three is we should never put our confidence in our work but only in God who enables us to accomplish the work. And remember that your circle of influence, no matter how large or how small or wherever it may be, it matters. How you live out your life is a witness for Christ or against Christ. And ask yourself, what do I wanna be remembered for? Let me pray. Father, I just pray as your word falls on us this morning and 
we face opposition or our character is slandered, Lord. Help us to remember to counsel ourselves, to come to you, to pray, to know that you are sovereign and you don't miss anything. Help us to bring it to you, to leave it with you, and to trust you. Lord, I pray for these ladies as they go home on these slick streets that you would bring them back safely. I just ask for a double blessing. They got out in this nasty rain today, Lord, to hear your word and to be in community with one another. I thank you for that. It's in your precious name, amen.